everybody. It's uh, Maris here. Thank you for joining us for another draw along. Um, I, I'll introduce myself. My name is Maris Wicks. I am a Boston area comic book artist and writer. I love the ocean. Uh, bonus fun fake. That's what my name means. Maris means from the ocean. So I get to partner with the aquarium and do these really fun uh, draw alongs. So it's, I, I don't know. It's it's join me in my apartment. It's lonely here. <laughs> so um, it's February and uh, this time of year is always really hard for me because I miss the ocean. And yes, I could go into the ocean, but it's really cold outside. Um, it's around, it's in the, you know, 20s Fahrenheit. It's cold. So I always start thinking about how much I miss all of my ocean animal friends and tide pools and at the sandy beach. So I thought it might be a good idea to write them Valentine's this year. Um, so uh, I'm gonna share my screen. We're gonna be drawing today. Um, I'm gonna be drawing in Photoshop with a tablet. Uh, you do not have to use these tools. These are the tools that I use so that I can draw um, in a video. Uh, I'll show you my, my preferred way. I've got my sketchbook right here. Don't, these are spoilers. You don't look at my Valentine's. Um, I, I always do a little bit of uh, research beforehand, so I've looked up a lot of the animals we're going to draw, but you do not need to be an artist to draw today. All you have to do is just bring your enthusiasm and um, love of the ocean never, never hurts. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get started. Um, oh, and the fun part is I'm going to read you the Valentine and you have to try and guess what animal I wrote the Valentine for before we draw it. <laughs> this, is, this is very exciting for me. Um, okay, share my screen. Okay, uh, ba, 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 ba. Oh, let's see if I can. Boop. So, um, oh, and before we get started, uh, the things that I usually, I, I like to try and break down how we draw or how I draw these animals just so that you can draw along with me because um, drawing is a technical skill and it's a skill that you can learn and practice. Uh, it's not like a special magical talent. I don't have to like, you know, say a bunch of magic spells before I draw for the day. I've been drawing for almost 40 years. Um, so I, I've had a lot of practice. It's my full-time job. Um, but when we draw, I'm gonna put my little, my helper, helper things on the side. Um, so we're gonna focus on body shape if we're drawing an animal. We, we're gonna draw one thing today that's not an animal because because these animals need a habitat. Um, fins or limbs, so like what their appendages might look like, uh, mouth and mouth shape. Uh, and these are all things that won't just help us draw them, but they'll actually help us learn about the animal. These are the same things I would focus on um, when I was out in nature trying to identify an animal or learn about what their life might be like. Eyes, uh, eyes and mouth are two big expre expressive things as well. Uh, I am a cartoonist, so these animals are gonna be a little cartoony, just a warning. Uh, patterns and any stripes or shapes that they have on their body, that's another thing that we help identify them with. And uh, this last one is not necessarily something you can learn from looking at a single picture, um, but behavior, how the animal acts in its environment. And ideally, I'd love to be in the environment drawing the animals. Um, I have drawn in very cold places before, but uh, it's a lot easier to draw when it's nice and toasty. Um, so all those things in mind, the first Valentine poem that I want to read to you is this one. Seaweed is green and red and brown as well. When you get scared, you hide in your shell. Who could that be? <laughs> you might think it's two different animals. There's two animals that I feel like this one comes to mind. Uh, the first hint is in the seaweed part is what this animal likes to eat. So uh, I'm going to turn off, I'm going to turn off the valentine and we'll start drawing this animal and maybe that will give you a, a better clue. So uh, for those of you who know me a little bit more than just in this video, uh, I love snails. I've loved snails since I was a little kid. I think they're awesome. Oh, I spoiled it. <laughs> we're drawing a snail. Surprise! Um, so we're going to start with the shell. <laughs> I got so excited. I ruined the, I ruined the surprise. Um, and I've actually, I think snail shells are really hard to draw. And I, if, if you joined us in December for the draw along, I also drew, well, I drew things with shells. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I was trying to think of like, is there a way to simplify a snail shell? So I'm going to try. So let's start with just like an oval. It would help if I had the right, right color on there. It was on white before. 
I'm gonna start with just an oval shape. And um, I usually recommend if you are drawing at home, start with a pencil or something with an eraser that you can do light lines. Um, I'm gonna try and do these light and then maybe do dark lines on top or they're just gonna stay sketchy. Uh, but you're also welcome to use clay or if you wanna just like write about the animals, that's fine too. There's no right or wrong way to join along today. You could also just like watch me draw because maybe it's, maybe it's fun. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I'm gonna start with our little oval. And then we're gonna give our oval a triangle on uh, the side that's pointing up. So little triangle. Okay. And then we're gonna break this triangle into a couple little chunks. So one there and one there. So that's gonna be our like basic little little snail shell. And if you see me looking down, it's because I'm actually looking at my little, my little cheat sheet. Um, and it's not really a cheat sheet. It's just that I did a little homework before because uh, cartooning is super fun, but I still use uh, real life to inspire me. So I look at pictures of real animals if I need to draw a cartoon one, and that gives me an idea of what they, roughly what they look like. We're gonna make the bottom of our circle or oval thing uh, a little flatter. Go ahead and erase that part. Um, when I draw by myself, well, which is like all the time, uh, I sometimes do sound effects for like the the noises and I sometimes do like little songs and then every once in a while if I'm drawing something with a face I will make the face of the thing I'm drawing and I didn't always know this uh, and uh, back before the pandemic I would go out and draw with other artists now we video chat which is still fun um, and people would notice me making the faces and be like oh my gosh you're making a terrible face right now and I'm like well that's the face I'm trying to draw um and I do that even for cartoons sometimes I'll make the face in the mirror take a picture with my phone and look at what my face is doing and that will help me um photos and stuff can always help you um there's nothing wrong with using references uh I think it's it's something that I've I've learned to do since I was since I was we um and then it's okay to draw from well Draw, but it's okay to draw on inspiration from actual actual things. So if you're having trouble with a face, make a funny face, take a picture. If you got a sibling or you know, make one of your parents, guardians, just make a funny face. Um, it's really fun. I feel like it's it's very freeing to like draw something when it doesn't. It's not that it doesn't matter, but it's like drawing just for fun. Um, okay, that was like a pretty good. This is a pretty good shell. Kind of looks like looks like an upside down ice cream cone. So if it were, there'd be a big slimy <laughs> snail ice cream. <laughs> We're gonna draw a snail's body. Um, this is a periwinkle snail. That love letter was to a periwinkle. They're one of my faves. If you go to a rocky beach in um, the northeastern or mid-Atlantic part of the United States and you see little tiny snails on the rocks at the beach, those are probably periwinkles. Um, and they're on those rocks because there's some delicious underneath. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But let's let's give this friend some uh, antennae. We do little antennae poking out. Now, I said that these guys have a slimy, um, squishy, like muscly body. They want to protect that body because there's lots of stuff that wants to eat them. Uh, not me, don't worry, snail, I won't eat you. I know you are edible, technically I could eat you, but I'm not going to because you're one of my faves. And I think I actually have to get special permit to harvest periwinkle snails from the beach. Same thing with like mussels and stuff like that. So we got our two antennae. And uh, a lot of times you'll see Part of their body that kind of looks like a little half circle and that's just their little radula or I guess the radula is underneath but their mouth and we're going to take a close-up look at their radula in a second but it kind of looks like a little little cute thing sticking out. Now a lot of times in cartoons you see snails with eyes at the end of their antennae. Um, garden snails have them that way but marine snails like our periwinkle do not. They have their eyes at the bottom of their antennae so you can give this friend some little eyeballs and their <laughs> eyeballs uh their eyes are very simple they can see light and dark shapes um so they can't see detail like we can but that's okay they mostly just need to tell if there's something that's going to eat them like a gull or a foot that might accidentally step on them so watch where you're walking when you're hanging out on the rocks and maybe you'll see a little bit more of their their foot sticking out towards the bottom, but most of the time their bodies are kind of like hidden, tucked up inside so that they can hide inside their shell at a moment's notice. Now, um, I used to work at the aquarium as well. And one of my favorite parts is when snails in the exhibits would uh, stick onto the glass. So we're gonna draw this periwinkle snail 
uh, imagine it stuck to a piece of glass because I want to show you what their mouth looks like. Now, any of you who have home aquaria, uh, if you have freshwater ones, you know snails are really good tank cleaners because they eat algae, which is another word for seaweed. You could, well, you could just say algae and that would cover all your bases. Um, and there are, there are snails that live in freshwater too, but again, we're going with the salt water. So snail stuck to glass. So imagine the snail is stuck onto my computer. We're gonna draw its foot, which also kind of looks like an oval. Maybe it looks like a piece of non. I was thinking about like what, a lot of times I think about food shapes or I try and think of like, um, I don't know, like helps me remember if I can associate a shape with an object. Um, it also kind of looks like a bean, I guess. It looks like a sideways bean. So that's foot. Um, we're not actually going to be able to see the shell very well, so you could just draw like a little circle behind that foot. And I actually, I definitely had to look at a reference for this one because this is a, I usually when animals are in a different position that's not easy uh, to recognize, I, I definitely look for photo references. So at the top of that foot, um, and I say their foot, that's like the name for their, most of their body, like the whole body part. They have a lot more body and organs that's tucked inside their shell, but their foot is like this big mm, sticky muscly thing that comes out. So I want you to draw a circle at the top of that foot. This is the same circle that's down here, but now we're seeing it stuck on to the glass. Um, and we'll go and we'll draw their antennas as well. Doo -doo -doo. Do, do, do. Don't forget those little eyeballs. Oh, hello. I'll just stick it onto your glass there. And we're going to get in so I can show you the radula. So um, when snails at the aquarium would stick onto the glass, you can actually watch their radula move. And their radula kind of looks like you're, you're zipping and unzipping a zipper. Um, it's, it's kind of like a row of like little scrapey teeth. And they're really good at scraping with periwinkles, they're really good at scraping algae off the rocks. So if you look inside, you'd see it go like this. It's really, it's really adorable. Um, so we're gonna do our best to draw. This is kind of like the fleshy outer part. And it looks like it kind of looks like it's singing opera. Oh, um, I'm going to eat the seaweed. And then the radula kind of looks like that. Oh, oh she's, she's a cute little chubby mouth. Oh, so cute. You stuck onto the glass. And I don't know, I like to imagine that the periwinkle snails say, om nom 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 nom, when they're scraping up that delicious algae. And in this case, uh, I know he's talking, I said, imagine they're on a glass, but in nature, they most likely be stuck on a rock doing this. And if you ever stepped on rocks at the beach, especially ones that are um, uncovered by the tide, you might notice they're very slippery and slimy. And that's because they usually have algae growing on them. And that algae is delicious. It's like a kale smoothie for the snails. Um, so yeah, that's our little friend. Um, and it's cool too. You can also, one of the neat things, if a snail is stuck to glass, you can actually see how their foot moves. And there's kind of like a little seam down the middle. And when a snail moves forward, one side will go and then the other side will go and then the other side and the other side. And they'll kind of like, cause I, I mean, I'll, I'll watch a snail. I'm like, how does it move? I feel like I felt the same way when I looked at a snake for the first time. I'm like, how does that thing get around? And then you see it and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, it just does a cool like, mm -hmm. um, but snails, cause they, I mean, I know they're snails and they're not very fast but they can, they can actually go pretty fast when they need to for their own scale. I could beat a snail in a race, sorry snail. Um, but I, you know, Maybe if it got shrunk down to a snail size, I wouldn't. Um, I think we should draw one more little periwinkle, uh, just cause practice our shell drawing. So I'll try and do, it's like a, I don't know, it's almost like a mug. No, that's not a good idea. Sometimes I'm, sometimes I'm thinking this stuff as I go. I still like our like circle with a triangle stuck to it. I think that kind of works or oval with a triangle. Um, and I went in and got a little fancy and rounded the sides. Um, like I said, I, th I, I struggle with spirals and snail shells, how to draw them, just because they're very, they're very unique shapes and they're not shapes that we, uh, I think, see or draw very often. I remember as a kid, I was always psyched when you found like something that spiraled in real life. Like I was, uh, you know, not necessarily real life, but like um, human made things like a spiral staircase. I always thought those were really cool just because like, oh, I don't see spirals very often. Um, same thing with like twisty, twisty pasta. <laughs> like, oh, it's spiraling, cool. 
Um, so we've got our, our little, and again, I'm getting a little fancy at it, thinking about the snail shell in kind of three dimensions. Um, and maybe we'll have this periwinkle come a little bit further out of its shell. Maybe it feels super safe. So we'll draw that that foot. So its foot can kind of look like that when it comes out all the way, kind of like a, a slipper. I thought about doing slipper snails and limpets and stuff today too, which are other mollusks, uh, but I might just devote a whole drawing day to mollusks one time. Um, I got a, I got, there's a couple other animals I want to draw today. So, um, and in this case, their, their radula is kind of retracted. So you don't really see, you don't really see the kind of bump with them eating. So we'll just draw our little, it's on the bottom. Draw our little antennae and our little eyes on the side. And that's our snail friend. So um, I guess we could actually draw a rock for this snail to stick onto. So maybe start another, start another layer here and we'll draw some, we'll draw some rocks. Just cause, cause I feel like it. Don't worry, I'm not drawing on top of the snails, I'm drawing on a different layer. <laughs> we'll come back to those rocks later. Okay, so I wanna read you the next Valentine that I wrote. Um, it's kind of related to the snail, but I don't wanna to give too much away. I'm really good at spoiling these. So uh, the next one is for another animal that uh, you wouldn't necessarily find near the rocks. You might find them in tide pools, so little um, places where the water is left behind at low tide. Um, but most of the time I find this animal that I wrote this love letter to, love note, um, sandy beaches under the water. They're one of my favorite animals to look for when I snorkel. So your home's on your back and it's not too shabby, but I won't bother you. I know you get crabby. <laughs> And I feel like this was a little bit of a lie because sometimes I do bother these animals. I'm very gentle, but a lot of times if I'm snorkeling and I'm down on the bottom of the, the sandy bit, I'll see if I can get this animal to crawl in my hand a little bit because it tickles and they're super cute. So uh, you've probably figured out that uh, the animal that I'm talking about is a hermit crab. And I wanted to do snail and hermit crab together just because I feel like they, they need each other. It's true. They need each other. Although the hermit crab has to wait for the snail to be dead for it to really need, each other, need, need the snail. We'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. So. Um, I'm gonna bring our snails back and oh, I'm gonna copy them. Boop. And I'm gonna get rid of our poem. And so snails do not live forever. I'm sorry if you thought that. Eventually they die and their squishy bodies disintegrate or get eaten by something and they leave behind their beautiful shells. So it'd be a shame if we couldn't use those shells for something good. Uh, and this is where hermit crabs come in. So every single hermit crab that you see at the beach in New England is wearing a recycled snail shell. I guess you could say reused snail shell. Um, that's, their, that's, that's their home. They can't make the shells themselves. They rely on snail shells um, for their house. So we're gonna draw some friends in these shells. And hermit crabs have a very different body than a snail um but their body is adapted to actually fit their like back end into the snail shell which i always thought was just like super cool um so hermit crabs they got 10 legs most of the ones you're going to see on the outside or are the the first three so six total and then the, the other legs uh i can do math the other four legs are inside holding on to that snail shell so it doesn't fall off um but we'll start with the eyes got little eyes on there got one two little tiny eyes. And then um, the species of hermit crab that I actually wanted to talk about was uh, long clawed hermit crabs. And I, I'll put up both the names for the snails and the hermit crabs up at the top in a second, both their common names and their uh, science names. So kind of just looks like I'm drawing a human leg. I'm not, it's, it's a crab leg. Although we probably could, we get a little silly and give this crab like weird human feet for a second because that would be hilarious. <laughs> Uh, maybe you can do that on your own time. Uh, so those two front ones are going to have the the, uh, the business ends are going to be claws. Uh, the business ends. Um, and this long clawed hermit crab couldn't pinch you, even if it tried. Um, their claws 
are basically like a little tiny fork and knife for picking up little bits of dead stuff that they might find in the ocean or in tide pools. Um, we'll make it waving. Hey. Give this friend some antennae. Um, and you'll notice that the eyes are up on stalks. So uh, instead of having eyes kind of squished into their body like the snail, their eyes are on stalks so they can kind of poke their little eyes up, look around, stick them back in. Because the eyes are delicate. If you have eyes on stalks, you want to make sure you can you know, move them around and keep them safe. Because um, like nobody wants to get their eyes bitten off. That just, this is not fun. Um, so let's put our little claws. I'm sorry, I haven't been talking about the shapes that we're breaking the animals down into, but hopefully it's clear enough as I'm drawing them. Um, and like I said, the rest of our legs are, if we had like x-ray shell vision, um, we could look inside and see how the rest of this hermit crab's body is kind of tucked on. It's got two little tiny legs back there. Um, so just imagine that you got to see in, inside the shell. And yeah, again, these are one of my favorite animals to look for, mostly when I'm swimming at a sandy beach. Um, in New England, I live in Massachusetts, uh, usually where I swim, I like it to be sandy just because it's a little easier to get in. But most of the beaches I go to, it's sandy in one spot. And then if you walk long enough on either direction, you'll find little rocky bits. Um, and that's my other favorite part of the beach for going tide pooling, to look in where the water settled around the rocks when the tide is low uh, to look for animals. Because they're two different habitats, sandy and rocky. And you can find a whole bunch of cool different animals. Um, and I like both habitats because I think there's fun stuff in both. Um, there's also another uh, oceany habitat in New England uh, and also mid-Atlantic and probably lots of other places around the world, but I, I'm talking mostly about my local local stuff, um, called a salt marsh. And I don't always like to swim in a salt marsh. It's usually pretty muddy, um, but it's a really cool habitat. And it's actually a nursery for a lot of baby animals. So not just small invertebrates like this, but a lot of baby fish. Um, hang out there. So it's a fun place to snorkel if you can find a good place to get in. Uh, I think the last time I snorkeled in Sand Marsh was down in maybe Sandwich, Mass, um, which is down near the Cape, and was a name that I loved as a little kid because it was like Sandwich. <laughs> oh, it's exciting. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of towns in Massachusetts that I really liked. I also really liked Braintree because like if you, if you see the word Braintree on a sign, you just think of a tree that grows brains. Um, I had an overactive imagination as a kid and I still do. So I'm gonna do a little bit more cartoony with this, this hermit crab. And if you join me in the December one, I know we drew some cartoony hermit crabs, but um, we'll give this, this friend uh, some slightly bigger, bigger eyes so we can make them a little bit more expressive. So, and uh, with animals that have antennae, you can also use their antennae to show expression. So like, I want this hermit crab to be curious about a little piece of dead food that it saw, but we'll change the expression in a second and, and see if we can make it a little bit more worried. So let's make it reaching out with one claw. And I'll draw it like that first, just because I think it's easier to break down. We'll keep that other claw back there. And actually, you know what? I, I changed my mind about the shape. I want to angle it down just a little bit. So I'll draw that other other one down and then I'll open up the claw. The claw, it's kind of like opening up a half circle. Uh, and erase my little guidelines. Um, legs for days these hermit crabs have. Um, and I'm simplifying these a bit. I think there's actually more joints and joints are where um, well, you know, on a, on a person, like my finger joints, there's one there and one there um, where I can bend my finger and one there down there. Uh, hermit crabs, you can look at their legs and I think there's more joints. So if you wanted to get like a little bit more scientifically accurate, you could pull up a picture of a hermit crab and uh, draw the right amount of joints. But I think I'm simplifying by just putting one on there. Um, that's just what I do sometimes. Sometimes you have to simplify because if you make it too realistic, a little tricky. So let's look at this a little, little bit of, well, I don't know. I don't know what this is. Maybe it's a little bit of dead fish. Surprise, a little bit of dead fish. So this hermit crab is reaching for that dead fish. Um, so maybe it's not a little bit of dead fish. And once the hermit crab pokes it, it was the eye of a flounder that's been hiding underneath. So we want this hermit crab to be a little bit more surprised. So our antennae might stick straight out and I can show you what we can do with the eyes as well to draw a little bit more surprised eyes. 
we can make those pupils a little smaller. And then I like to do little lines where it's like, oh, oh my gosh. And maybe we'll change this, change this arm. I mean, how do I want to change this arm? I think I'm instead of having it reaching. So imagine it poked, imagine it poked the little thing that it thought was a piece of dead food. And it's gonna pull that arm back in. Cause oh, maybe it thinks it's gonna get eaten. I don't really know what goes through a hermit crab's mind. I have a feeling it's a lot of like fine food, fine food, don't get eaten, fine food, don't get eaten, don't get eaten, fine food. That's probably a lot of what goes through their heads. Um, I'm thankful that I can have slightly more thoughts than that during the day. But I guess as humans, we have similar thoughts. Um, so maybe this ended up being poor grumpy flounder that did not want its eye poked. Hey, what are you doing? I'm trying to sleep here. So little little exercise on changing body language and also expression to have the animal react to something. And this is where I get excited about the behavior part. Um, part of why I use cartoons to uh, communicate or show off science is that I feel like there's a story, especially in the natural word world. You can't just like not look at animals interacting with their environment and think about the, the story of that. Um, and I do that even when I just look out my windows here. I don't, I, I do, the ocean is not close by, but there's lots of birds around and squirrels and things. And I do, I like to think about what it's like for them. Um, okay, so I think we're done with our crabs and our snails for now. See you later. Oh, and I'll put up the name for a second. So the first one that we drew is a periwinkle snail, Litorina, Litoria, and long clawed hermit crab or long wristed hermit crab. It had a bunch of different common names, which is uh, Pagurus longicarpus. I might have said that wrong. I don't know Latin. Uh, but I like to put both names on there in case you wanted to look up, up uh, pictures for yourself to, to draw from these animals. Um, and that's something I do try and do, because when you, when you look up pictures for periwinkle snails, there's a bunch that pop up that aren't periwinkles, and I get upset. I'm like, that's a garden snail. Get it out of here. Um, so sometimes just the internet's not the greatest if you have a guidebook, or if you can find a website. I think Massachusetts I don't know if it's fish and wildlife. There might be a pretty cool site that has uh, animal profiles. And I believe the New England Aquarium does as well. I can't remember if they have them for tide pool animals. They might, because there's a tide pool exhibit. Um, okay, so let's go to our next, our next love poem and see if you can get this, this, this animal. Uh, I do want to say that this animal, I feel like shows up the most in salt marshes, which is the place that I told you people don't necessarily go to to have like a day at the beach, but it's a really cool habitat. Um, so, roses are red, your blood is blue. You've been around since the dinosaurs. It's true. Anybody, anybody guess what this animal is? It's one of my favorites. Um, I'll start drawing it and maybe it will jog your memory and I'll try not to spoil it this time. So I'll take away the poem. And if you can see on my screen, there's like definitely, <laughs> the answers are on this little window right here. Don't look. <laughs> um, so this animal has long been one of my faves just because I think their body shape is so cool. So I'm gonna start with a half circle. Actually, we'll draw this animal from the top down. They, they look very different depending upon if you draw it from the side from the top or from underneath. So we'll start with a half circle. And cut that in half. And then we're gonna add a triangle. A lot of half circles and triangles going on today. Oh. I don't know why. A lot of times you see uh, re repetition of shapes and stuff in the marine environment because uh, it allows the animals to move faster through the water. But this animal is very different from a snail. Um, and this is maybe the most uh, distinguishing feature is gonna be at the end of this animal right here. Um, you might wanna get a ruler to draw to draw that part. So anybody, anybody guess what this is? I'll put its name up. It's a horseshoe crab. It's the Atlantic horseshoe crab. You Limulus polyphemus. Uh, I think there's four species worldwide of these fabulous animals. They're not actually crabs. They're more related to spiders. Uh, there's a lot of stuff with common names where it's like, okay, you know a seahorse isn't actually a horse, right? Um, so horseshoe crabs, not actually a crab, but that's okay. I like calling, I just like calling them fun stuff. So we're going to get a little bit more detail. There's a lot of triangles on this animal, a lot of pointy bits. Um, a lot of times people are a little, uh, 
I don't want to say scared or freaked out, but there's definitely some people who look at these animals and are like, whoa, that thing's terrifying. Um, and part of it has to do with this animal uh, doesn't have a lot of ways to defend itself. And when I show you its mouth a little bit, you'll be like, oh, that's cute. It's got a little toothbrush mouth. Uh, but especially as a young horseshoe crab, it needs to have ways to tell predators to be like, hey, don't eat me, I'm pointy. So you're going to see all those pointy bits. So there's two little points back here. Um, and this is kind of like the top, the front part of the animal, just making that line a little more. And then there's a whole bunch of the stick off the side. Yeah, triangle fest, woo. And like I said, this, you know, I wouldn't mess with this, it looks pokey. And on this head part, there's two compound eyes. A compound eyes you might have heard if you've talked about insect eyes before, like a fly eye, and it kind of looks like a, um, like one of those little like kaleidoscope or little prismy things. Um, they're kind of like a whole bunch of little eyes that form to make a, a, a better all seeing eye. Uh, so horseshoe crabs have compound eyes that you can see. And they've also got this weird little thing right here, which are another set of like uh, simple eyes, kind of where we talked about the snail eyes. They can only see the light and dark. Um, and then it's got a bunch of other photosensitive parts on its body. And photosensitive parts just means like kind of like eyes all over the place. Um, and that helps it just navigate. If you think about its body shape, it can't really see what's going on in the back. <laughs> I mean, I know we don't have the eyes, eyes on the back of our heads either. Um, but for a lot of animals, it kind of makes sense just to like keep their bodies protected. Um, so one of the other parts that I think maybe makes people uh, think these guys are a little scary is you've got these little like pointy, pointy things on top that make them look like grumpy eyes, but they're not grumpy. <laughs> it's just like when you cartoon them, it's like, oh, I made them look grumpy. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to do that one. Um, it's kind of another half circle within there. Um, because this part, when we draw from the side, I'll show you, it kind of slopes down and it comes out almost like the brim of like a visor or like a, not like a baseball cap, but like a, a cycling cap, like a little short, a shorter, shorter visor on a hat. Um, and then this part's kind of bumpy. Boop, boop. This part's also kind of bumpy. And then there's usually little spikies on that part of the tail too. Now, this tail looks scary, right? Um, it cannot sting you. Um, it is pointy. And if you stepped on this, it would feel bad but it would probably hurt the horseshoe crab more if you stepped on it. And their tail's really, really important. So if you ever see these friends at the beach, please do not pick them up by their tails because they can fall off. Um, you know, we talked about joints earlier and my finger and then also the hermit crabs. Well, horseshoe crabs have on this top back part, they've got two really big joints. Right here is one. So there's kind of a, a fleshy squishy part that allows them to bend in half right there. Um, where I just made it darker. And then where their tail meets their body, there's also a joint there. And if you look at it, it actually looks a little bit like kind of cartilage. It's a kind of white and not super squishy, but a little squishy. And it allows them to, to move their tail around. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, so there's our horseshoe crab from the top view, the aerial view. Uh, I'm going to copy and paste just so that we can draw the bottom view. So I'm gonna race out all of what we've drawn and show you what they look like underneath. Cause that's where the party's at is underneath this animal. Um, or at least I like to, I like to think that because it is a party underneath. And they look pretty similar. Like there's not much different around the outline. Um, this part comes in a bit, almost like a little bit of a snow plow. And then get ready. Cause these friends have 10 legs. Um, not unlike the hermit crab, but very different. So uh, mouth in the middle and for the legs, I'm going to do these quickish. They're, if you look them up, they're like very detailed. Um, but we've got one, two, three, four, five. That fifth one kind of is longer and it dangles. Um, one, two, three, four. They've also got little helper ones in the front that help put food into their mouth. And we'll talk about their mouth in a second. So we'll get those little helper ones. And then these legs are jointed. So again, I'm probably going to get the amount of joints wrong but that's okay, I don't mind. If I were drawing this horseshoe crab for work, I'd probably spend a lot more time on uh, researching and looking up the anatomy. You can see on my, this is my little sketch that I did earlier before I drew with y'all. Um, just cause that's my, that's my little bit of work. Now at the end of each set of these legs, this one, 
has kind of looks like scissors, but if you were to touch them, they're more like chopsticks. They, they aren't like sharp and pointy um, and they pick up food similar to chopsticks. They just come together and they can pick up food and put it in their mouth. Um, now, the one that we're drawing right now, the horse crab is a female because um, the first two sets of, of legs have the little uh, like kind of sister shapes. Uh, I'll show you what males ones look like in a second. Get these ones down. Oh, this looks just so cool underneath. Um, this is one of those animals that's like, it's so amazing to see because like from the top, you'd be like, I never would have imagined this animal would look like this underneath. Um, and I want to go into their mouth. I told you these animals have, a, have teeth like a toothbrush. Their mouth is basically just a whole bunch of like little hairy bristles. Well, it looks like that. And I'm going to erase the middle. And kind of not exactly like our snail, but it's kind of like little bristles that can like kind of rub up dead food that they find lying around. And then below there, um, where they breathe, their gills, they have book gills. And book gills are named that because they're shaped like pages in a book. Kind of like if you open up a book and just saw the pages. Um, and when horseshoe crabs are little, they can actually move their book gills like that and it helps them swim as little tiny horseshoe crabs. Oh, they're so cute when they're tiny. They're extra pokey when they're tiny. Have you ever seen a little horseshoe crab? Oh, and I meant to tell you, uh, well, I'll show you the size of what one of these ones might look like in a second. But, so this was a female horseshoe crab. They can get to be about the size of the top of a five gallon bucket, which, I have behind me, it's gonna be a lot to wrestle it off. Just imagine about, 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 about that big. Horseshoe crabs are a lot smaller. They max out at about um, uh, maybe 10 to 12 inches across. And I'm doing this from memory. So if you look this up and there's different numbers, uh, it's just because Maris's memory is a little, can't remember. But the other way to tell a male horseshoe crab is that their um, top set, instead of having little like scissor or chopsticky style, They've got little ones that look kind of like little boxing gloves. Do, do, do. And the reason why they have that is because when they mate with females, they need a little way to hold on, kind of like romantic, pig, romantic piggyback ride. Um, and their front legs are just adapted to do that so that they can make more tiny horseshoe crabs. Well, there's a little horseshoe crab anatomy lesson right there, complete with reproduction. Um, I'm gonna scoot them over just a tiny bit and I wanna draw them from the side and then we'll move on to our last. Oh, we have two more. If I, I might have to cut, I might have to cut the last one and just leave it as a poem, but that's okay. Um, so from the side, these friends are very interesting. So it's also kind of, uh, it's not like a half circle. It's almost like a hat, I guess. So that's the side part, that little joint right there where its body can bend. Another little joint there. And then oh, I'm not gonna have enough room for the tail. Tail's just going right off the page and that's okay. Um, and I wanted to do the side view to talk about why the tail is so important. Hello, friend. If a horseshoe crab ever gets flipped over is no good. Because when they're flipped over, their mouth and their legs are all the delicious parts and they can easily get eaten by things at the beach that might also try and steal your sandwich or french fries, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so I'm going to turn this friend upside down. It's not the position it wants to be in. Uh, but what they can do is that they can take their tail and move it in a circle like that. And if they find ground, they can take it, stick it into the ground and push their body back over so that they can turn their body's right side up again. Um, and that's why it's really important they keep their tails on just because that's their only protection against predators when they're in the shallow area of the water. So my like nice little quick animation. Okay, horseshoe crabs, we'll see you later. Um, we're going to go on to uh, well, this is, I feel like I'm not sure if I can actually call this one a love poem to this animal, but whatever, I'm gonna read it to you. Ketchup is red, French fries are yummy, but let's face it, you'll put anything in your tummy. So what animal that you might find at the beach do you think I wrote this love poem to? <laughs> it's the same animal that might try and eat a horseshoe crab or a periwinkle or a hermit crab, um, or your french fries or your potato chips or your sandwiches or just like anything. Um, yeah, 
it's a gull, a seagull. Um, so I'm going to draw just a fast gull just because I, uh, true confessions, I did not have time to do my homework for the gull. <laughs> But I feel like they're one of those things that I can draw from memory. So if you want to just be like, okay, this is the easiest way to draw a seagull. Are you ready? There you go. You're all done. Passed. You draw a seagull. They're in the distance. Um, but I think seagulls are kind of amazing. I mean, the seagulls that we have, or the gulls that we have in New England, the herring gull, they live here year round. Um, so they put up with our hot summers and our very cold winters. So for seagulls, I think of usually just like, a football shape. And this one's going to be maybe a little bit more cartoony than uh, <laughs> than the other drawings we've done. But that's, you know, I just want the seagull to. And herring gulls have uh, dark grayish wings. Hmm, I feel like, I feel like the legs are in the wrong spot. <laughs> this is the one perk of like using Photoshop is I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna move this over a little bit. Um, and uh, a sketchbook hack for that or drawing with a piece of paper, uh, post-its, post-its are great. So if you ever just like don't wanna erase part of your drawing and build on top of it, little tiny post-it notes are awesome. Or even just the piece of paper taped on there. You don't have to always erase if you don't want to. Um, I know a lot of people who work in animation use post-its as a way to like edit parts of their drawings and that's, that's fine too. So let's give this friend a head. It's pretty good. And a beak. So I'm getting a little cartoony here. And an ostril. I think this guy has a little bit of a red um, part on their beak. I don't really know what to do for the eyes. This is one of those ones where it's like, well, I can make them kind of cute. I can make them kind of, that's, <laughs> hey, are you gonna eat those french fries? Um, but really when I see gulls at the beach, I feel like, <laughs> like this is what's going on. It's just like, oh boy. <laughs> and we'll draw this friend some french fries because I feel like, you know what? Even a gull deserves some free french fries at the beach in February. Um, a little, a little trough. I love the little paper trough that sometimes beach friend. I don't know. Should we do crinkle cut or like crinkle cut? Too hard to draw. I'm going to do regular French fries. <laughs> if you want to do crinkle cut though, go to town. You can tell that I'm not a food artist. <laughs> like it's just a bunch of leaves. Um, we'll make this one nice. Oh my goodness, this girl is so stoked. So stoked. Maybe French fries. Um, and I think I could actually probably do a better job of your eyes and goals. But again, if you want to draw just a quick goal, you got the little letter M there. Um, I think maybe the last goal drawing that we should do before our, our last poem is uh, I feel like when I see them coming at me, that's like the part where they're kind of scary. So I'm going to try and think about how their bodies act. And this is a lot of times I went back to behavior, um, but like gesture drawing is something where like, if you can get the energy of the drawing, even if it doesn't like really work that much anatomically, um, it's okay. So like, it's okay to sometimes just like look at an animal in motion and like try and like scribble what it looks like. Um, there's no right or wrong way to draw. And a lot of drawing, honestly, is just like a lot of experimentation. Um, and, you know, I like to talk about how sometimes I definitely have like drawing days where I'm like, I, I'm not I'm having a bad drawing day. And you probably feel that with anything that you've done before. Like if you play a sport, there's definitely been a game where you're just like, I, I don't know what was wrong with me today, but I was off, it just wasn't working. Um, drawing and writing, and even for school, when I was in school, I would sometimes have a day where I'm like, that was rough and I don't know why. Um, and it's okay to have those days, it happens. Um, and that's what I do for my job. Sometimes I have a hard writing or drawing day and that's, that's, just, that's just it. And that, when I have days like that, I try and remind myself, or if I can, um, just like, 
either do something else like go for a walk or uh do something and try not to be attached to it so sometimes i'll just like draw a bunch of scribbles on a couple pages of my sketchbook because i'm like nobody cares about these scribbles i don't care about these scribbles and letting letting that like it will loosen me up um because i can get really frustrated when i'm having a bad day i don't know i think this is like this is you know my nightmare where it's just like you, know, you turn around and there's a gull just like we're gonna eat that um Hope I'm not insulting any gull enthusiasts out there. I think they have little claws at the end of their feet. Um, kind of do that one with like duck legs. But yeah, this is terrifying. Terrifying. Okay, you know what? I'll make it looking at the, uh, it's locked onto the target. It's going to eat the french fries. Okay, so there are my ridiculous gulls. <laughs> um, I have one last poem that I wanted to read. Uh, and again, I was talking about how I miss the ocean, especially this time of year, even though I don't live that far from it. You wave to me as you go, but I know you'll be back. I can tell just by looking at the lines of the track. So what do you think I wrote this le le love letter to or love poem? Um, it's not an animal. And there's a there's a key word in there in the first line that is your hint, and I think for this one to to play us out, um, I'm going to go back to I'll leave that there. Go back to this first panel when I started to talk about habitats, and I drew the rocky habitat there. I think we'll draw a sandy one over here. So. That's my little love poem to the ocean. Um, I have loved the ocean since I was a little kid. I grew up in Massachusetts in Franklin, um, which is about know, an hour outside of Boston, uh, kind of in between Boston, and Worcester, and Providence. And when I was a little kid, we used to go to Horseneck Beach, was like the big beach that we drove to. Um, but as I got a little older, we'd go up to Maine, where the ocean is a lot colder. It's where my family lives now, um, but awesome awesome rocky habitat, just like really fun to go uh, looking for animals in the, in the, uh, in the tide pools there. But really any, any ocean is fine. And if it's not ocean, I'm happy with just like ponds and rivers and streams too. I think they're great. They all have special places in my heart. Um, and I say that because like, you know, I have lots of friends who have either never seen the ocean or they didn't see the ocean until they were adults just because they grew up in the middle of North America. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I always say like if you love water, just try and find places to make it part of your life, even if it's just like a little a little pond. And um, the the poem specifically is not just about the ocean, but it's about the tide. Now I, I threw around the words high tide and low tide a couple times today just because um, the animals that we're talking about live coastally. They live on the, you know, right where the water meets the, the ocean. And whether it's a rocky habitat or a sandy habitat, the water level at those places does not stay the same. Um, the tide is basically like the name for how gravity pulls the ocean one way or the other. And usually it's uh, the moon and the sun, the gravitational pull of those things. So if you go to the beach and you're sitting on your towel and you notice that the water is coming closer and closer over the course of an hour or two, the tide's coming in. Um, and if you wanna do this safer than using your towel, what I say is I find a piece of driftwood and stick it right where the waves are coming. And if the waves over the course of 15 minutes are coming past the stick, the tide's coming in. And if they're going away from the stick, the tide is coming out. And that's a good way to, if you didn't look at the tide charts. Um, but between high tide, and high tide is when the water level is gonna be the highest. Um, and I'll draw high tide on here right now. High tide can usually cover all of the rocks. And forget my towel, it's coming all the way up the sandy beach there. Um, but it's great because like the seaweeds all like woo this is awesome and like snails are feasting on the rocks and horseshoe crabs might come in and hang out. Um, my very quick horseshoe crab drawing. Up, up, up. Draw some snails. Hey, what's up? This is like a fun thing to do or just like try and draw them as simply as possible and let them still be the animals that they are. And then at low tide, um, these rocks are exposed. And the seaweed's all droopy if there was areas where there's seaweed. And our snail friends usually are trying to stay down 
where it's closer to the water because even though they can hold their breath for a little bit out of water, um, snails do need water to breathe. Um, or at least these snails, not snails in your garden, those are a little different. Um, and a lot of times it's just fun to like, I like to experience the beach at both times. Low tide's kind of my favorite just because the tide pulling part, but it's fun to go at high tide too. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed drawing along with me today. I hope you had fun doing your drawings. Um, feel free to, there's been a bunch of these at the aquarium is been awesome about posting since uh, you know the past year it's been a little tricky we can't all go get together and hang out uh, in person so if you're looking for uh, other art things to do like this there's a whole bunch of other videos um, in addition to that if you're just looking at cool aquarium stuff the aquarium has been posting a lot of really awesome educational and like behind the scenes videos as well on their youtube um, and if you want to support the doing with aquarium feel free to donate uh, just because it's a really cool organization that obviously means a lot to me. I worked there for eight years, but even before that, when I was a kid, it was one of the biggest ways that I could connect with the ocean. So uh, enjoy Dream of the Ocean and it will get warm again someday. <laughs> we'll get to go swimming and go tide pooling. Um, and mad props if there's anybody out there doing winter tide pooling. I just can't do it. It's too cold for me. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.